episode 87 of the Real World Wellness Podcast. Hi everyone, I'm Christine Lehman, a certified nutrition therapy practitioner and the reverse diabetes coach, which is also the name of my website. I'm accepting a limited number of clients in May. Remember, you can contact me through my website to request a free 15-minute consultation. Also remember, while you're listening to the show, advice and information we provide is intended to be helpful and informative, but it's not a substitute for medical advice or treatment. Today I'm going to talk about dark chocolate, which frankly is one of my favorite foods. And this will be part one, or the first in a two-part series. So today I'm going to talk about the history of chocolate and how and where the plants are grown and related health benefits. Next episode, which is part two, I will talk more about the artisanal process of chocolate making and what to look for when you're buying high quality dark chocolate and recommend a few companies that I buy from that engage in sustainable and some often fair trade practices and I'll define what those terms mean as well. So let's get started. So what's all the buzz about dark chocolate? I think the main reason is that several studies have come out showing that dark chocolate is healthier than other types of chocolate, especially milk and white chocolate. And I'll talk about why that is in a little bit. Also another tip is that the higher the amount of cacao, and usually um, expressed in percentages, like 72%, that means there is less sugar in the chocolate bar. Uh, sugar is often an ingredient and of course you want an organic uh, coconut or sugar cane, something along those lines. But aside from that, um, you want to keep in mind that if you're trying to have less sugar, you want higher amounts of cacao. So I typically choose something, uh, a dark chocolate that has at least 70 percent 70 or even higher and I even tried one as high as 80 the other day and it was surprisingly delicious. I think um, the concern is that it's going to be a little bit bitter or tart um, and it depends I think on the brand or the company that you buy from. So uh, anyway we'll get into all those nuances in part two. But today let's talk about the history of the cacao plant which contains the beans that are harvested and turned into dark chocolate. And I'll provide in the show notes the sources of some of the statistics that I will be mentioning today. So the cacao tree is believed to have evolved in the upper Amazon region, which is in South America, and an area that now includes parts of Peru, Ecuador, and Colombia. From there it spread northward, probably with the help of early Amerindians across the Andes and into Central America, where it became part of their diet and culture. When Cortez, who was a famous Spanish explorer, landed in Mexico in the early 1500s, he found, it, he found that cacao was intricately woven into their culture and mythology. It was mixed with maize and spices, and it was consumed as a beverage by royalty, warriors, and rich merchants, while the seeds or beans were used as currency. I just find all this really fascinating. So the Spaniards took this beverage that the natives were drinking and replaced the maize, which is uh, from a corn um, and has been around a long time. They replaced it with sugar, for better or worse, and added cinnamon and vanilla, which are obviously a spice, cinnamon's a spice, and, and uh, vanilla is a flavor, flavoring type of um, item. So over time, all of Europe developed a taste for this new beverage, which they called chocolate. It would be chocolate in Spanish. And soon cacao was spread to tropical regions around the globe. And we'll talk about why uh, that's important in terms of growing cacao plants. So early attempts were made to grow cacao like sugarcane on large plantations, but they found that the cacao grows best in the shade of taller trees. So it's particularly suited or well suited for small family farms and home gardens, which is another interesting thing. This is, believe it or not, as much as 80 to 90 percent of the world's cacao is produced on farms of seven acres or less. 
So I kind of have this image in my head of these large kind of plantations or farms, but that really isn't to the reality of where cacao is grown. So where do the cacao beans come from? The fruit is called a cacao pod. It tends to be oval in shape. It can grow anywhere from six to about 12 inches long and from three to about four inches wide. And when it's ripened, it sort of turns from yellow to orange and can weigh up to uh, a pound. And the pod contains 20 to 60 seeds. I also thought this was interesting. And they're usually called beans. And they're embedded in this white pulp. And um, when you click on some of the links I'll provide in the show notes, you can see some images of these. Uh, they're, they're also called fruit uh, that contain the pods. So, and they're uh, kind of almost a milky white looking color. And so when they extract the seeds, which contain the ingredients used to make chocolate, the pulp is also now saved and um, extracted in some countries to prepare juices, smoothies, jelly, and something called nata. So you may want to Google that. It's spelled N-A-T-A. So the pods are harvested individually by hand, then sliced open to remove the seeds and surrounding pulp, which are then gathered into piles for fermentation. So the fermentation is an important process because before that occurs, the cacao beans taste almost nothing like chocolate. So if you're thinking, wow, I'd love to just taste those beans, you may be in for a rude <laughs> surprise there. Um, because it's going to be highly astringent and that's the purpose of the fermentation is to eliminate or drastically reduce the astringency which gives it this sort of bitter taste and to increase the cacao's flavor complexity. So here's an interesting fact. Approximately 500 cacao beans are needed to produce one pound of bittersweet chocolate. One worker can harvest about 1,500 pods per day, which is enough to produce nearly 100 pounds, I'm sorry, 120 pounds of bittersweet chocolate, while it takes another worker an entire day to open all those pods for fermentation. So each con seed contains a significant amount of fat, and this was also somewhat surprising to me. It contains as much as 40 to 50 percent of fat. And this fat is called, not surprisingly, cocoa butter. Uh, the most active ingredient is theobromine, and it's the compound similar to caffeine. So if you've ever eaten quite a bit of really good quality dark chocolate before you go to bed and you're wondering why you're wired, that's why. It has uh, this, it has what I think of a uh, uh, this caffeinating uh, ingredient. So it isn't that much different than having a little bit of coffee before you go to bed. So I don't recommend, obviously, eating <laughs> other than maybe a small, very small piece uh, before bedtime. See, another interesting thing is that chocolate, ma chocolate making has become very artisanal. But, and so there's also, if you think of wine, there are different varieties of grapes that are used to grow. And again, cacao is a, is a plant. So I guess it's not surprising when you think of plants that there be varieties, right? So there's three main varieties of cacao. And uh, they have Spanish names, so I'm gonna try not to butcher it, but it's criollo. The double L is usually pronounced as a Y. It's spelled C-R-I-O-L-L-O, -L -L -O, forastero, which is like, almost like the word forest, but not really. Forestero and Trinitario. And Trinitario involves the word three. Trinity comes from that, three. So that actually demonstrates more where cacao has been than where it is now because the names no longer correspond to pure genetic strain. So it's just really, I'm just telling you this because it's just an interesting fact, but it, it's not, it doesn't hold as much weight in terms of the genetic strains anymore, which purity would have been an important thing. Uh, but it disappeared many hundreds of years ago as a result of cacao's penchant for spontaneous cross-pollination. So 
as far as the plant world goes, there's cross-pollination and hybrids and so on. So deliberate hybridization also has occurred on no numerous occasions in the 400 plus years of cacao's history as a cash crop. So just like cotton became a cash crop, cacao certainly has been a cash crop and it's highly valued in many uh, developing countries. So that brings me to where is it grown? Well, I mentioned uh, tropical climates, so it's actually grown exclusively in the tropical latitudes 20 degrees north and south of the equator. The cacao producing regions, uh, not surprisingly, include Central and South American countries where it really originated um, as far as the chocolate making, um, but it's also in more than just the three countries I mentioned. It's also in Brazil, Panama, Venezuela, and Caribbean countries, such as the Dominican Republic and Jamaica. Again, they're all in this sort of equatorial region. And so, not surprisingly, Papua New Guinea, Indonesia, and then the island of Madagascar off the coast of Africa. And that's not the exhaustive list. Um, the exhaustive list is on, I believe, Wikipedia. So what about the health benefits? Of course, being a um, certified nutritional therapist, this, this matters to me. I um, always th am thinking about this and how can I maximize that? So, and I touched on a little bit of this in episode 80 when I interviewed doc the nutrition researcher, Dr. Rosa Lamuela Reventos. So you might want to revisit that discussion where we got into phytonutrients, which basically are nutrients in plants, and this uh, category called flavanols. Not, uh, it's spelled F-L-A-V-A-N-O-L-S. So cacao plants contain various flavanols, O-L-S, which are natural nutrients which some research shows has been found to increase oxygen flow to the brain, which could improve cognitive function. These are not definitive studies, hence the language. In 2014, the European Food Safety Authority approved the following health claim for coca products containing 200 milligrams of flavanols and meeting the qualification in dietary supplement products. And the statement they approved, or the claim, says, Coke, and I'm quoting, cocoa flavanols help maintain the elasticity of blood vessels, which contributes to normal blood flow. Now, in my opinion, that's a very cautious statement. Um, the other statement that I just read is actually goes, the, based on a research study, goes a little bit further. They're saying it can lead to increased oxygen flow to the brain which could improve cognitive function. So anyway, uh, you can take it, you know, for what it, what you think that's worth. But there could be some health, that, that could be obviously a health benefit. I'm all in favor of improving cognitive function, especially as I get older. So um, flavanols have several subtypes, and those have been studied for their health benefits. So one of them is called proanthocyanin, Cyanadins. And uh, so that is an organic compound made by the plant that is not needed directly for growth, but it has been found to promote antiviral, antibacterial, and antioxidant effects. So chocolate definitely has some antioxidants. And I always, that's great for reducing free radicals, which can damage, cause cellular damage, and has anti aging properties, and so on. Now another flavanol is uh, called pectin. Uh, pectin is from, again, this particular uh, cacao plant and it has antimicrobial effects and the potential to be used in the pharmaceutical, nutritional, and antibacterial industries, especially as a preservation agent. So between the two of them, uh, it definitely promotes, um, I would say, as an antiviral, antibacterial, antioxidant. So there could be some anti-inflammatory uh, effects from this. Antioxidants typically help with that. 
And also, frankly, um, infection, because when you think about it, antiviral, antibacterial are caused by, you know, obviously viruses and bacteria that can cause um, infections and, and uh, health problems. So when you think about equatorial climates where this was grown, that would be very important, especially microbial as well, because uh, some of the uh, the diseases that are found in tropical climates can be very deadly. So it, I always like that nature provides these effects in areas where it's often, you know, corresponds to some of the uh, um, problems that um, and diseases that would be caused by you know the insects and the mosquitoes and, and snakes or what have you that it tends to grow more in tropical climates so there's sort of this natural natural remedy in these plants so that's I think a, a good benefit So remember that also each seed contains a significant amount of fat. I me mentioned 40 to 50 percent as cocoa butter. So that's an important thing. When you're looking, at, read the ingredients, and you're looking at the ingredients label uh, on the back of a bar. Typically, we buy a chocolate bar most of the time, and you want to see um, that there's cocoa butter. Well, why? Um, it contains a fatty acid called stearic acid, which is a saturated fat, but it's the only one that favorably affects the high-density lipoprotein. And if you just quick primer on cholesterol, you have your HDL and your LDL, and the HDL is the good cholesterol, and also it doesn't have any negative impact on your LDL because that's the, the wrap if you will, that saturated fat has been given um, is that that's going to increase your LDL or your low density uh, lipoproteins and those actually, the stearic acid contained in cocoa butter not only doesn't negatively affect that, it positively impacts or impacts your HDL which you always want. HDL is very important for your health in many ways, so the good cholesterol. Um, so it's important to note that white chocolate, uh, you may like, some people I'm sure prefer white chocolate even over dark or milk chocolate, but it doesn't contain the cocoa butter found in dark chocolate. So that's, I think, in a, sort of um, a little bit of uh, omission, if you will, in white chocolate, a rather, you could argue, somewhat important one. Um, also you want to make sure that you're getting the cocoa mass or cocoa solids which contain these flavanols that I've been talking about. So I look for both the cocoa butter and the words cocoa mass or cocoa solids and you want a pretty high percentage of that in, in your dark chocolate. So I'm going to leave it uh, again. Um, there and say that in the next episode, which is part two of this series, I'm going to get into more of what to look for when buying chocolate, including the uh, um, terms like fair trade and organic certification and GMO free and what it means to be sustainable because these cacao plants, as I mentioned, are mainly found in what I would consider developing countries and uh, they're in areas that um, involving trees and perhaps even near rainforests. Um, so the fact you want to, that they're eco-friendly and are harvested and processed um, in a sustainable manner is very important for the environment. Also terms like fair trade and organic certification because fair trade means they're paying the farmers who are doing the actual hands-on work a fair price and that's important I think as well and then there's the whole organic certification which you may see on some bars but not others how important is that it's GMO free um, so that comes into play perhaps more in a milk chocolate um, but it's important again to understand what 
truly artisanal chocolate making is and, and how it, uh, it can be done in a sustainable way. So we'll get into all that. I invited a couple of founders of a couple of chocolate companies that I would buy from uh, to be on the show. Um, they may or may not be able to. I know they're very busy. But either way, we'll, we'll chat about this in the next episode. So until next time, have a great, healthy week.